forgot. All right, we're good. All right, we're ready now. Thank you, everybody. So uh, we are doing a Q&A with Tammy Burhels today about betrayed trauma or about betrayed partners and betrayal trauma. So question number one for you, Tammy, what is betrayal trauma? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, a good question. But it's, it's in it. So sometimes people experience physical um, symptoms of this. I find many betrayed partners have like uh, some chronic health, you know, issues, um, uh, is something that wasn't happening before betrayal, but at, at its most simple form, it's, I think it's the fracture. It's the, the trauma that hits the actual physical trauma that you get emotional trauma that you get from the discovery of someone that you care about, or that you thought you could trust that has fractured that they have betrayed you. They have lied to you. They have done something, you know, that their behavior has caused you um, pain. And so there's a fracture of the trust. I also see consistently that it causes the betrayed person to question everything, you know, the entire relationship, what's wrong with them. And there's nothing wrong with you, but that what's wrong with them that they didn't see it that they have shame around that. So, you know, it's complex, but like PTSD, there, sometimes there's chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a thing. And betrayal trauma, you know, is not something that, oh, it happens. You tell me something and whoop, I'm traumatized and now I'm good. It's like this whole process that needs healing um, in order to, I really think, um, not, not continue to experience the negative symptoms of the trauma. Thank you. Um, I've heard Dr. Rob say, and I know it's also in some research that he did, that with betrayal, particularly intimate betrayal, it's actually the lies and secrets that do more, especially long-term damage, but also short-term damage than the actual whatever it is you're covering up. Is that, is that do you see that with people when you work? Uh, yeah, I I think, you know, we hear this consistently for the partners that, um, uh, of the clients that come to our program too, that they'll often even share, you know, the problematic behavior, like I hate it, but it's the chronic lies, you know, and, and deceit, the gaslighting, you know, where I'm telling you, no, 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 you're, you're all wrong, you know, even though you've got evidence of you know, of the actual betrayal, but, but uh, again, that's the fracture of trust because, you know, like if you're lying to me, you're not being truthful. You're not living in integrity. Yeah. And as you said, uh, betrayed partners will question everything that you've ever said and done, not just, you know, the recent stuff or the current stuff. Um, and I think that's a perfectly normal and rational thing to do. Um, well, and I think they also like, they, I even see where they go you know, this relationship has been fractured. Are any relationship safe? Like it can yeah. go that deep where, you know, even somebody who's never betrayed them and really isn't, you know, looking to do that, you know, like their, their trust, their level of, or uh, their ability to trust anybody, you know, is damaged. Yeah. Um, is it normal for betrayed partners to feel and possibly even act a little bit crazy um, after discovery? I hear consistently that partners go, this isn't who I am. I do, I'm doing things that I would never have done otherwise. So yeah, and I hate to use the term crazy. I, I think that they're right. so distressed that their actions and reactions, you know, are not coming from their true self. They're um, you know, they're on such high alert and they don't have the bandwidth. I use that term a lot. They, you don't have the bandwidth to be able to, to, to think things through and go, you know, how can I, you know, mindfully, you know, act toward, you know, in this situation, it's just, you know, it's so raw that, that, and I hate to use the word normal, normal and crazy. I mean, <laughs> is it typical yeah. for a betrayed partner to display behaviors that they would not do in any other circumstance? Yes. Yeah, and thank you for that correction because yeah, I know Dr. Rob would would say no, we don't use normal and we don't use crazy. Um, but um, yeah, when you're in crisis, we're not always our our most rational selves and our truest selves. When we're in crisis, and and discovery of betrayal creates massive crisis. Um, next one here, and this was asked to me today by a betrayed partner, so I really want to hear your answer. 
Should betrayed partners have compassion and empathy for the addict? I think shoulds and shouldn'ts are like always and nevers. Um, yeah. um, I, I think it's um, kind of moralistic, like, well, you should forgive them. You should do this. You know, no, what do you need to do for you today? Um, I, I, so here's one way to do it. Does it help you to understand that this person is broken, that they're not doing this to you it, in their brokenness? It is hurtful. It is absolutely hurtful to you. And I think it shifts things. It, it, it can help um, reframe things in a way. It doesn't take the, the, it doesn't make an excuse for the addict. But if you can see this person is a broken person and that behavior is a result of that brokenness, you may be able to have compassion about that. You don't have to have necessarily compassion or, you know, uh, or I'm going to support this person. No, you, you need to, you know, this is like, you need to deal with you to take care of you. We talk about put your oxygen mask on first on the airplane, put your oxygen mask on you. You are the one person that can take care of you that can create safe boundaries for you. Your addict, especially early on, can't be that person to show up for you. So, you know, getting the support that you need. And then, you know, like I said, shoulds and shouldn'ts I don't find useful. You know, do you feel ready to have some compassion for that person? Great. Will you feel compassionate one minute and hate that person the next? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you pre do you, um Betrayed partners sometimes choose to ignore it and hope it will go away yes. or sweep it under the rug. Um, it, it, when there is a pattern, of, well, why do they do it? And if there's a pattern of this, how can they break the pattern? Uh, there's so much fear attached with this. And you know, so I wrote this one down. This was in order to have the choice to stay, you have to know you can leave. And I thought that is I wrote it down because I was like, that is so helpful to remember, you know, that you need to know that you can have that choice because otherwise you feel stuck. And so if you're stuck and feeling like you're, you, you need to go into protective mode, I've had partners that have said, I want things to go back to how they were. And I, and I was like gentle about it, but going, no, you don't. He was lying to you. And I use he and she for pronouns just for ease. So yeah. he, the addict, she, the partner, but you know, this spans both all um but but no you were living in in a world that wasn't true he was compartmentalizing he was lying to you he was gaslighting you he was doing all of those things it had the illusion of looking like it was safe but it was never it was never safe it was never real so in recovery we can choose to be on a different path is it bumpy yeah is you know, are, is there some pain involved yeah so why do people avoid it? Because, uh, because it can feel like if I just ignore this, or he says he's going to do his work and he'll never do that again. And gosh, don't you want to believe your partner, this person that I chose to be with, don't I want to believe this person really is going to do what they say they're going to do, even though they've been doing all this other stuff. So yeah. And particularly early on, don't you find this too, Scott, that you know, if it like they've just had one discovery, they're more likely to go, okay, he says he's going to do this. So I'm going to believe him. I want to trust him. When it's around to the ninth time, they're kind of like, yeah, I, I, I can't trust him. <laughs> yeah. At some point they're over it. They're like, no, nope, don't trust you anymore. Um, but, but no matter how many times the, the discoveries happen, um, and this is for the addicts in the audience, um, this is why I wanted to question Tammy because she can answer from a partner's perspective in a way that I can't um, I, I always talk from the addict's perspective but as an addict um, don't expect your partner to start believing you just because you say that you're doing everything right it's going to take six months to a year of action proving you're doing everything right before your partner is really going to start to trust you again um, and that's just the way it is. And the more times you've been discovered, like Tammy said, the worse it gets and the longer it takes. So, yeah. And I think you're being gracious with the six to 12 months. I think it's really 12 that's to a minimum. 24 months. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, you know, and that's you really showing up with your actions. I say all the time, and I know you do too, it's your actions, not your words. You know, you can, you know, we lied with the same lips that we're saying, hey, Hey, you know, believe me, believe me. No, no, your actions. How are you showing up? What are you doing that's different? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, do betrayed partners sometimes lose their, their sense of self? And I wanna preface this by saying, I was talking to a betrayed partner earlier and she told me she had lost her joy in who she is as a person and I was devastated. So is this common? Um, why does it happen and how can betrayed partners get their self back? And that that's the the answer to the last part is is time and support with other betrayed partners and other, you know, and working through the trauma. But yes, I hear this all the time, you know, body images, you know, like I, I have no value because he chose all of these other things, you know, it's, you know, sex workers or affair partners or porn or whatever. And so, so the self image, the body image, you know, shifts. I, I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't funny enough. And sometimes you know this too, that it's the blaming from the addicts and hearing that message over and over again. Well, if only you had, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, then I wouldn't have, which is not true you know um but i mean i i heard one today this was via an email that he blamed her political choice that he couldn't respect her anymore and that's why he had an affair with his secretary and other things but you know i was like oh yeah that's so not true but you know this person is listening to all of my choices have caused him to act out i'll do you one more too because i had somebody that i was talking to today and the partner was going like looking for everything to do to take away every temptation for him. Like he should work from home. He should not go to the gym. He should not do anything. And I said, you can't bubble wrap your addict enough to, you know, to keep him safe um, in this, but, but her shame around it's her fault. And how could she fix that? I could see her self-esteem negatively affected because she wasn't doing enough to create the safe environment so he would never act out again. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about gaslighting? Because, I mean, oh, you're kind yeah. of touching on that anyway here. Yes. So gaslighting <laughs> happens all the time and it can be about recovery. I mean, like there are people that use gaslighting about recovery. Well, I'm going to my meetings, I'm doing all of these things and, you know, and they're just absolutely lying, you know, but gaslighting is I'm going to tell you what I want you to believe in here, even if that's nowhere near the truth. You know, I, I think it's gaslighting if you go to your 12 step meeting and tell everybody in the group that you're doing really good and you're in recovery, but you just, you know, you just acted out on the way to the meeting, you know, to me, that's still it's lying, but, but the lying um, for an intentional purpose to keep you pushed away and to keep you believing that, you know, this is, everything's good. Just don't look behind the curtain, you know, blame shifting is another one that I see all the time too. It's like, like I said, you know, it's your political choices. So therefore you are, you are the reason I'm acting out. Like I had, I had no choice. Well, that's not, you know, that, that's giving another person a lot of power over you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, uh, I've heard Dr. Rob talk about gaslighting is flipping the script, you know, you know, yes. I cheat on Tammy. She asked me, you know, is that lipstick on your collar? And I, you know, say, no, it's marinara sauce. Yeah. Um, and then this she, happens to be in the lip print, but you know, yeah, she tests it and clearly it's not, but I insist that it is and that she's crazy. Yes. Um, and if she wasn't so distrustful, everything in our relationship would be fine. Yes. And I, I shift all the blame onto her, even though, you know, and I make it to the point where I cause her to question her sense of reality. And, you know, where she starts to think, well, maybe it is Mariner's sauce, even yeah, though yeah. her five senses say, nope, nope, that's lipstick. Yes. You know? Yeah. 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 Well, I had one um, um, that the partner... Um, <laughs> he pulled in, he was using chemicals as well, but he pulled in after he'd been with an affair person and um, was intoxicated and he parked over the landscaping, like over the shrubbery. And she pointed it out to him. And he said, I always park there, you, you know, I mean, and, and it's just like, like the insanity of the addiction to go, like, you're going to believe this, even though we have a shrub there that used to be okay, but now it's not. But, I mean, like, but that's the insanity of the disease that I'm going to lie to myself and you, 
you know, rather than taking ownership and going, I can change, I, I can learn to do things differently. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've been gaslighted, I mean, you need a support network around you so you can reality check this craziness. Um, because it really undermines, it's a form of abuse and it undermines the betrayed partner's sense of reality and, and self-esteem and, and it makes it hard to trust yourself. Um, and it, this does not mean that betrayed partners are gullible. Um, gaslighting starts slowly and builds over time. Oh, I have to work late at the office today. You know, I'll be home by midnight. Okay, that sounds believable. You know, and you're doing this for us. You know, you want a big promotion. You know, um, oh, I'm sorry. I was working late and I fell asleep at my desk. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, you know, didn't call. You didn't know where I was, even though. And I turned my phone off because I was working. You know, you know, we can edge up, you know, well, he does work late a lot, even though, you know. And before we know it, it's like, I told you I was going away for work for the weekend. Uh, you were tired. You didn't hear me, obviously, because I told you. Um, and you knew. And you said, okay, you were fine with that. Why are you so mad at me now? I mean, that's a whopper, you know. But when it's, you know, just slowly up, it's, you know, the analogy, and it's a horrible analogy, but, you know, you put a frog in a pot of water that's warm, and then you turn on you know, the gas burner, the frog doesn't ever realize it's being cooked um, because the temperature rises so gradually. Um, and that's what gaslighting is. It's just a slow turning up of the temperature. And it is a form of abuse. And uh, yeah. Um, it is. And, you know, you, you know, you mentioned it's crazy making for partners because you're like but but i i see this i ha i have evidence on my phone but you're telling me no like what you're seeing is like completely not you know not your thing the other thing i was thinking of was again um love bombing i see this you know in certain cases where you know the addict is is saying all of these things and i'm reading through it and i'm going like I don't hear any responsibility it's like oh I just love you so much I, you know like you don't understand I just love you so much and you know I had to break my your you requested that a no contact but I just love you so much so I couldn't honor that boundary you know yeah. well and then that partner's going oh he loves me so much and I'm going no he didn't honor your boundary you know yeah. but but they're used to hearing it and they want why would you not want to think that your partner is is showing up for you that is is being the real partner yeah. so that the two of you can move through life i mean i get that completely yeah yeah and this is um one of the things and and this is a this next bit is a huge difference between seeking integrity and dr rob and a lot of the rest of the community that deals with sex addiction and betrayed partners is um we celebrate a betrayed partner's desire to stay connected and to love and to want to care for the addict and to hope that the addict will come around. We celebrate that. We call it pro-dependence rather than using the codependency model, which is like, well, you know, dump him, move on. Um, well, or what's what, what wrong are your with thoughts you and your family? Fam well, I hear, yeah. let's talk about your family of origin and why did you pick this person? Right. You know, rather than going, gosh, you saw the positive in him. And, and you know, there's a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. And you see those characters and traits. And then there's this really, really awful piece that is so hurtful to the whole relationship. But that, you know, yeah. And when you go talk to other people, they'll they'll start, you know, shifting the blame to you, which feeds into, guess what? The blame shifting and gaslighting. Addicts love codependence because that means it's partly at least your fault. It, it's not me. It's your fault because you didn't do something right. Not not true. So I love prodependence because, it, you know, yes, we celebrate that you love someone who's got some brokenness. That doesn't mean you have to stay. But but if you stay, we're not going to go. What is wrong with you? You know that you're staying with this person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, codependency, it's, it's really blaming and shaming toward betrayed partners. And it it often says either very directly or indirectly, if you don't change and work on your issues from your childhood, you're stuck with this addict forever and your behavior is feeding the addiction. And, you know, it, it, it just goes on and on. And betrayed partners will often 
turn away from help that that you know because they're like no you're not reading this situation right at all i i so i'm really happy dr rob came up with pro dependence and articulated it the way he did it's like no we should celebrate people for wanting to stay connected um, now let's figure out how we can do it with better boundaries yeah yeah but but i really like i said i think it's such a you know it's such a hook for addicts to go well you know mm -hmm. it's really this it's not it's yeah, not if me, you were married you know? to her you would it's like and that was the like, language around 12 steps you know a uh -huh. lot you know well of course you're an addict not understanding that all the addictive behavior that you did was what you know we don't want yeah. use crazy but was crazy making for a partner who's going like yeah. you know yeah 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 you say you love me and yet you behave you in ways that are exactly the opposite so mm -hmm. okay um we know that betrayed partners can heal. We've both seen it. Um, how dependent, if at all, is a betrayed partner's healing on the cheating partner also healing? I think that's a great question. And I see that I think a betrayed partner can heal and even stay in the relationship, even if the addict is not. They find a complete support network and they and it's so that that person's behavior doesn't rock them every single time they have another discovery, which they will. They just kind of go, that's that person. And, you know, 95 percent of that person is good. I know that the integrity, I know that, the, you know, and they, they're able to navigate that. And there can be so many reasons, long term relationships, financial, I mean, whatever health issues, you know, so that there are reasons as long as they have support, you know, and the focus isn't all about that person's behavior, they, they can do really well. I do really believe that if the addict gets help and changes, the faster the addict changes, the easier it is for the partner to, to make that transition because they start to be able to see that this person's becoming trustworthy. They see that there's hope, you know, and they can take the focus off just the behaviors. I think I often say, you know, I can always tell when a partner is either early in, in the process or stuck because, you know, they're so focused on just that person's behavior and, you know, how do they create safety rather than, you know, I've got my boundaries, I'm taking care of me and, you know, I'm, I'm, it's going to bother me, but I'm not going to let it, you know, completely wreck my world. Yeah. Okay. Last one that I have for you. Uh, what are the best resources for betrayed partner healing? And second half of that question, which you can feel free to ignore is, are there any resources you do not recommend? Yeah, um, I, I'll start with that one. You know, anything <laughs> that goes to the codependent stuff, like it just, you know, and there, that's still out there in, in lots of, of materials where, um, and the other thing that bothers me a lot is when it's um, going to just the victim, it, you know, yes, this happened to you, um, and it sucks, but, but staying stuck as a victim, you know, like that person's be, I, I, I do separate the behavior from the person, you know, I don't think we are all just our behaviors. So that person's behavior was reprehensible, hurtful. I mean, just all kinds of, you know, negative things, but the, there is brokenness. So the stuff that helps partners is to understand that, yes, they are a victim of that person's behavior, but they can be empowered to find their um, healing. I, I was on the betrayed partner group today and I won't share you know specifics, but one, one person, we, I always say, this is the club you never wanted to join. And somebody said, I'm glad I did. I wish I had found this earlier because my friend source, all of these amazing people that are supportive um, are, you know, are people I'm really connected with. They have relationships with people that are real and meaningful rather than superficial. So these people have found that they are resilient. They are stronger than they ever thought they were there. I mean, like they're, it has transformed them in a positive way, even though the genesis of it was, you know, not fun. So, so there's lots of resources. I, you know, I, I, I think it's a combination of things, you know, I, I think getting, if you can afford it, getting betrayed partner um, uh, therapy for or the betrayal trauma, sometimes it's some um, trauma therapy for some specific things, maybe EMDR. I love our betrayed partner work group, you know, that's taught, um, it's a psychoeducation, but it's taught as healthy boundaries and communication, what is sex addiction, all of those type of things, free support, podcasts, there's so many things. I think the biggest thing is 
yeah, I mean, reading books is helpful and partners devour them, but it, you, you know, just reading a book, you know, kind of fills your head, you get education, but it really is the stuff that connects you with other people so that you see these other people, I'm not alone. And these other people are finding their path and they're here to support me, you know, and I can do this too. So the, uh, the connecting ones are, I think, the most important to me. Yeah. And we have lots of free stuff on sex and relationship healing.com. And, and the um, work group that Tammy mentioned is really inexpensive. Um, you can find that at <laughs> integrity.com and always fills up and is loved. <laughs> so I'll just, yeah. Um, we're going to jump into the Q&A here, but first I want to thank Tammy because um, I completely sprung this on her with no warning and she did not miss a beat. So, Well, thank you. But yeah, that, was not, that is for sure. That was like, okay, no, <laughs> nothing like the hot spot. So yeah, so, so I really appreciate it. Um, and, and I hope, I hope everybody who's here and listening uh, because Tammy really knows this stuff. Um, okay, well, so take what you need and leave the rest. I always say that, you know, like if it's helpful, take it. If it's not helpful or not helpful at this time, leave it. It's it's all good. This is your journey. And there's like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the shoulds and shouldn'ts and, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, you're on your own path. We're here to support healing. We really want to help people heal themselves and their relationships. So um, th that's that's our goal. But, you know, we, we uh, we're just people, so. Yeah. Um, okay, first question here. This is from a betrayed partner. I'm wondering how much relational healing can happen if the addict doesn't address and do work on his core attachment wounds. Uh, we both have CSATs. He's been sober for almost two years, and we are two months post full therapeutic disclosure. I've been doing my own work on my betrayal trauma and childhood wounds. Every time we fight, his core belief of unworthiness surfaces, and I believe this gets in the way of him being able to fully or to be fully emotionally available to me. He gets defensive and goes into J, J, D, E. I don't know what that stands for. I don't remember, yeah. but yeah, I'm sure it's, it's shutting down uh, emotionally. Yeah, so. shutting down. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and oh, justify um, and deflect. I, I think it's, it, I've got Darvo up on my, I finally. Yeah. copy that one down but I think it's justify whatever and defend so but, it, yeah. but it's all good we get it he is you know so so my for you know my first thing on this is um we just talked about this on the trade partner group earlier today the Cartman drama triangle and I find it really helpful because every time we fight okay so you know this is the the, I call it the negative two step. You guys are doing, I do this, you do this, I do this, we do this. It's the same pattern. You guys are doing, you know, this. So what would be different if you said, I'm, I don't want to fight about this. I want to have a discussion. And even if you, you both have CSATs, you know, if this is an issue that you know, you're going to fight about, you know, how about, you know, how about journaling it and taking it to, to your qualified professionals? Nothing changes until something changes. I used to say nothing changes if nothing changes, but I was like, nothing changes till something changes was a new slant on it for me. And what happens if rather than focusing on his deficiency, which, you know, this is a process and he's two years in, you know, and if you start in kindergarten, you're not going to get to college in two years, you know, so, so he's got more room for improvement. This is a journey. But what happens if you did something different? If you went, you know, this would be an issue we would fight about. But if I'm looking to do the relationship different, I'm going to approach it differently. I'm going to take this to the therapist where we work together on this, you know, and bring it up. So th that it's important for him to work on those those core yeah. beliefs but it's not going to be you know an overnight yeah. quick thing and, and one of the things that both partners can do and and this is in our um, respectful conflict agreement which you can just type it into the search feature on, on our website it'll pop right up for you um is let's fight the problem not each other you know we're allies that. we are on the same team and to me, any any conflict I go into, if I can just remember that the other person and I are actually on the same team and we like each other, you know, I mean, if I can remember, oh yeah, we like each other. Let's let's deal with the, let's resolve the problem and not feel all personal about it. That's very helpful. But addicts, if you're out there, um, you do eventually need to work on your core attachment wounds. We have a couple of work groups, um, healing attachment wounds with Troy Love, and what's the other one? Why men struggle to love with Eddie? 
Eddie or Kepper, going, which deep, starts going deeper with Eddie Kepper, yeah, Richie. I, I okay. yeah, yeah. The why men struggle to love starts tomorrow, so there is yeah. still room. I, I put the link um, in the chat for the um, for the respectful conflict agreement, so you can click on Thank that you. or find it on our website. So, yeah, and and um, Dr. Caparucci and Troy Love, who both have work groups on this, are are both amazing on working on the attachment wounds, which is sort of graduate level recovery stuff. Okay, I got the sobriety down. Now, how am I gonna be more open and vulnerable with my partner? Yeah, and Troy does um, um, uh, yeah, a so. Friday drop-in mm. group for guys too. And so like that, that's free. And every Friday he's talking about the voices of shame. And, you know, like if I'm going yeah. into my you know, um, into my judge or my politician or my martyr or whatever it is, you know, because I'm, I'm feeling vulnerable. I can go, Hey, I know what, I know what this is doing. And I'm going to choose to use my, um, my adult, my adult brain. The other thing yeah. I was thinking though, is, um, I really love having a scheduled time where we, rather than having it be a fight, we we have 20 minutes 10 minutes each and and i'm going to bring i'm going to journal so i really know what i'm looking for you know with it it's not just well you know when the issue is this and i'm you know it's all covered in muck because i don't know what the real issue is so i've journaled and i know what it is so that you know that i can say scott you know this has been bothering me because whatever you know, well, we can talk about it and can we come up with a solution so that we don't, you know, end up just fighting about it? You know, that's a very different approach, but then you're both working towards a solution, which is both working towards the relationship rather than, unfortunately, I hear like the addict digging his heels in and, you know, like being defensive and which doesn't help. So, so we, we can do things differently if we're willing to try something different. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is from uh, another betrayed partner. So after, oops, where did it go? <laughs> uh, so after finally ending, ending his affair, a week later, he states he's in recovery. Is that truly possible? Also, how long does it take to move from sobriety to recovery to finally not being emotionally abusive? Um, I'm implementing boundaries left and right, but it just gets so exhausting. Thank you. Um, I like... You didn't see the major question. eye roll. Yeah, this, there was a it. major eye roll of like, yeah, like I hate when people go, we've been in recovery for three weeks. I'm like, so so I have a friend, He he's hardcore, but for the first 90 days, you couldn't even say you were in abstinence. You you couldn't even use that because it's like the first 90 days he didn't, you know, he, he, I was like, ooh, that's hard because like I want every day to count. Um, but I really talk about it as abstinence is just not doing the problematic behaviors. Sobriety is like, I'm trying, I'm I'm working on things, but yeah. recovery, honestly, you know, you're looking at probably pushing two years and yeah. then it isn't like you wouldn't go, he he's into recovery and then finally not being emotionally abusive. Recovery is I'm not emotionally abusive. I'm showing up as a real human being. I'm, you know, and, and you implementing boundaries now, like I, I want to check in on this because what, what I'm questioning is, are you putting up boundaries to be punitive? Like you're doing this, or is it, I, I need safety in my physical, emotional, financial, and spiritual. And I'm doing this to take care of me because I'm the only one that can take care of me. That's different. And then those boundaries aren't exhaustive because you're going like, nope, it's self-care. This is what I need. Um, and if he's pushing up against those, then you know, then you may have to withdraw. Now, Debbie McRae, and it's posted on our website, Debbie McRae did a great uh, webinar last Friday on healthy boundaries, the external boundaries. Great, you know, great thing and can help you, you know, unpack that. There's also, she did one on accountability. There were 10 for 12, 10 things about accountability. So him showing up differently, but yeah, like he's at best, maybe abstinent for a week. This is, you know, uh, but yeah, he ended the affair. Big deal. That isn't, you know, like if, if his lips are moving, don't believe it. It's what his actions are doing. And so you hold those healthy boundaries and don't look at them as, you know, it's exhausting. Go, this is what I need. And I'm empowered to take care of me. Yeah. And by the way, if you're the addict, do not expect a pat on the back for ending your affair and staying away from it for a whole week. Because this is what you signed up for when you got married. Uh, come on. Um, and your wife is not really going to pat you on the back 
for oh a whole week. Um, you know, um, you know, sobriety. Last time he said, "I'm not drinking. I'm not using. I'm not acting out. I'm not cheating on you today." Recovery is is about thinking change and feeling change, and be, becoming honest, becoming vulnerable. Um, actually, you know, making the insides match the outsides um, instead of sneaking around and showing you one thing and doing another and, you know, and blaming you, uh, you know, we talked about gaslighting earlier. Yeah. Um, and then just to tag on with boundaries, um, I always, you know, want people to understand my boundaries are about my behavior, not yours, mine. If you behave in this way, here is how I will respond to stay safe. That's it. I'm not telling you do this, don't do this, none of it. I'm saying if you behave this way, I will protect myself and here is how I will do it. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. You can do what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, that's, a, that's a healthy boundary. And as Tammy said, it's not so exhausting to set a boundary to protect myself. It's really exhausting if I'm trying to control your behavior and manipulate your behavior. That doesn't work. Um, so of course it's exhausting. Because uh, people fight back on that one. It's hard for, you know, if Tammy says, no, I'm not letting you in right now. You're not safe. Uh, what can I say to that? Uh, I have to respect it. And if I don't, I'm a real jerk. Um, yeah, you know, I'm calling the sheriff. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, so that's an easy boundary for, for me to keep, her to keep, whoever. Um, but if she wants me to behave a certain way, you know, I'm probably going to do the opposite just to tick her off. Yeah, you know. no, I, and, and that is so true. Addicts, like, you know, if you tell me what to do or not do, like, I still have to think about it. Like, you know, if, I, if it's a request or a suggestion, I love that, like, the 12-step programs are a suggested program of recovery. And I was like, the founders were brilliant because they knew that there was a bunch of addicts who would go, well, if you're telling me what to do, I'm not going to do it, even if it's for my own benefit. The other thing about boundaries that could be exhausting, I had this thought, if you're not used to ever having boundaries, if you haven't you haven't set them on any level, then it would be exhausting because it's new behavior for you, but you're worth it. You deserve, you know, Gavin, Mc, um, no, Gavin Sharp did a, um, a, a, a why addicts need healthy boundaries. And one of the things he said, and I've got that link, you can email me if you want it. Um, but um, he said, everyone needs healthy boundaries. That's what we do to take care of ourselves. And I was like, oh, we sometimes forget that because we go, oh, partners need healthy boundaries. No, we all need, you know, to set, we have needs and we need to set those healthy spaces. Yeah, definitely. Um, next one here. Um, I read that all addictions, food, drugs, sex, shopping, drinking, et cetera, come as a response to serious childhood trauma. Um, I get that some addicts blame her, blame the wife, I assume, but isn't that a blind addict alley for both the addict and the betrayed partner missing the real very old issues yes definitely tammy thoughts <laughs> yeah well e e yes and, you know and and oh i was thinking that with the last question too he stopped the affair but what else is he doing if he's doing porn and yeah. masturbation or he's drinking or whatever so so the whole thing but you, what you're talking about yeah like i always call it like the hole in the soul it's like i've got a yeah. hole in my soul and i'm looking to stuff it with whatever and for people who use multiple things you know it's i it's kind of like the garbage can i'll well i can't get to porn right now so i'm going to use food well i can't i mean whatever it is you know I, i'm going to use something else because i'm looking for external things to make me okay and it never works um mm -hmm. But yeah, and yes, blaming someone else, like even blaming, I love, Dr. Rob shared this again recently on the webinar and he said, you know, my, my parents, I had, a, I had a deficit, you know, when I was growing up, they weren't able to do that, but I love my parents and I don't blame them. They were doing the best that they can. So, so yes, everybody that comes through the addiction path, you know, has some combination of things in their past, but leaning into that and going, oh, it's all this fault, then you're, uh, you're stuck. You're, you're a victim of all of that and you can't change. What recovery gives us is how we deal with life. Despite those deficits, we can learn to do things differently. We can learn to parent ourselves. We can learn that we have attachment wounds and we can identify them and, right. and grow beyond them. So we're not stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And when Tammy talks about the hole in the soul, I mean, it does come from childhood trauma. It is driving the bus. Um, and as addicts, we, you know, there's not, it's a leaky bucket. 
I mean, I, I can pour alcohol and drugs and sex and prostitutes and porn into that leaky bucket from now until doomsday. And the bucket's never going to fill up because it's leaky. The way we fix the leak in the bucket is to go back and do the early life trauma work and, and you know, to understand what's what has driven us toward escape instead of connection, because that's what addiction is. Connection is scary. Escape is easy. So we chose the easy route. Um, you know, when we resolve our childhood trauma, process our childhood trauma, understand it, take control of it, whatever, whatever language you want to use, um, it's much easier to trust people. And when it's easier to trust people, we can connect with them. Um, you know, the, you know, addiction is an intimacy disorder. We're quoting Dr. Rob today. Addiction is an intimacy disorder. The cure for addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. And actually, I think we're quoting Johan Hari on that one. But I, I, I believe that is 100% true. The, the cure for addiction, it's, it's not about sobriety, it's about connection. If I am healthfully connected with loving, empathetic people, my need to drink and use and act out pretty much disappears. Um, and that's recovery. And that's when I can start treating other people better. Um, yeah. And you treat yourself better. Like, oh, yeah. you know, that that's part of it too, is like, we, we know that we have value. We're not living in the shame of our addictions, you know, knowing that we're, it, we're, you have that double life and all the lies and secrets, you know, so we treat ourselves better. And then we're able to, you know, to look out with other, you know, with eyes wide open, looking at other people, you know, and, and see that we can be trustworthy and they can too. And then we're still human and we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, oops. Um, I'm a, I'm a betrayed partner choosing to move forward with divorce. Um, any insight on how to protect my young kids if uh, he continues to not choose recovery? Good question. Yeah, and and it's challenging because you know they they want to see dad, and it's appropriate as long as the behaviors are not um, uh, it, 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 as long as it's safe in that. You know, is he looking at porn while he's, you know, got, he, does he have a computer open, you know, while they're, you know, in the room? Is he doing things um, that is problematic that would really negatively affect that? Or is he able to show up at least for them, you know, for the limited time that he has them? Sad for him that he's going to miss out on your children, but you will parent them well and they will have the love that they need. Dr. Ken Adams wrote a book on adult children of, of sex addicts. And I say that because um, you know, I know your kids are little, but um, listening to that, I think you can hear some of the things that the adults wish had happened, you know, through that time. Um, but you know, your kids don't need to know, you know, about his sex life or whatever. Uh, it, you know, it, it's challenging if he's got an affair partner or a string of them and he's, you know, hauling them in that that's problematic. But, you know, I think do your best to be the safe place and, you know, um, kids are more resilient as long as they get enough and you will be enough okay next one here how long does it take to work the trauma egg um, the trauma egg is is an assignment that is often used in treatment centers to uncover trauma we actually don't use it at seeking integrity um tammy i mean I, it, it, how long does it take it, it depends on the person who's doing the work um it depends on how capable they are of looking at the truth. I'm not a particular fan of the trauma egg exercise. Um, I don't find it particularly useful. I think there are better ways to go about that. Um, but um, I know a lot of places still use it. It's an old therapy exercise that we have faced out. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and, uh, yeah, and I think that there can be value. It's uh, like everything else, take what you need. Sure. Um, how long does it take to do it? I, I've seen people do it in an hour. And uh, you know, I've seen people or maybe do it in an hour and then they think of something and go back and it's something you use a, a crayon or marker, you know, you're not writing in the egg. So it's drawing pictures, you know, so there may be, you know, something that comes to mind that you add later. You know, the thing about this recovery work is it's never all done, you know, so, you know, you can be, you know, years down the pike and go, oh, wait, that was, you know, actually something too. And, and that's okay. So, um, but, you know, if you're drawing an egg, you may get a lot of you may get a lot out of it in an hour or two, you know, so. 
but work with a therapist that's that knows what to do with this. If yeah. so, if this is a betrayed partner and the addict is going, Oh, I'm still working on my trauma egg and it's been three months, that's called stalling. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're still working on step four, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yes, or step three. I hear this all yeah. the time. Well, I'm still working on step three as you're just scared to get to step yeah. four, and step four through nine yeah. is where the like the freedom is if you do that. So yeah. Okay. Um, okay. My sex addict husband and I have been separated for the past year. He is just starting his recovery process now while I, while I have been working my own recovery for over a year. I am in a good place in my own recovery. He is struggling with sobriety and had a major relapse last week. He suggested disclosing any further relapses with the 24-hour rule. Um, any advice on what to discuss in these disclosures and what uh, and what detail to give. We have not had a formal therapeutic disclosure yet. Um, so thank goodness you haven't had a formal therapeutic disclosure because he's still acting out. So, yeah. let, I, and this is, this will sound trite, but it's not. We have a, we have a, a residential treatment program for guys like this. If, if there's yeah. not get, if they're not getting traction, they need, what they're doing isn't enough. Our residential tr treatment program is 14, 21, or 28 day length of stay, and they get a solid foundation, you know, for recovery. They have an aftercare plan for them that will help them be successful and have the support, you know, that they need. So as far as, you know, disclosing a slip in 24 hours, you know, sure. I, I hear you doing great. What, what do you need? Like, you know, do you want to hear? Um, I think you having a healthy boundary about the level of sharing, um, but on some level, he's still in active addiction. He's like, yeah, he, he had a major, he's struggling with sobriety and had a major relapse last week. To me, I'm like, you can't be in sobriety if you're on an addiction cycle and every so often you're just relapsing. You can't even relapse. You're, you're acting out. You're on the addiction cycle. You may go 90 days and then you act out. That's just the addiction cycle. So to me, yeah. he he needs a lot more help um, uh, be, you know, before he, you know, he can really say he's on any kind of recovery path. I'm sorry, yeah. but I'm glad you're doing good. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you are working your own path. And um, it says you've been separated for the past year. Separated can mean a lot of things. Um, usually when I hear separated, we're probably not sharing this information at all. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, unless there are rules around that. So it sounds like you have some rules, you know, if you, you know, so it sounds like it's a separation where you intend to get back together. Um, otherwise, there's no reason for him to be disclosing to you. Um, detail, um, facts, yes. Um, Non-graphic language, yes. Um, and, and that's about it. Um, no excuses. Right, and no excuses, yeah. no triggering language, uh, you know, um, just, I did this with a person, you know, if it's someone you know, he needs to tell you who it is, because he kind of wants you turning to that person for support, um, you know, if there's a, if you need to get an STD test or something, he needs to tell you, um, but, um, you know, keep them really basic because they can be very triggering and it's best done in conjunction with a therapist, any, any kind of that disclosure happens um, where you can process it because you're going to have feelings that need to be processed. Um, so yeah, um, next one here. Yes, boundaries are my safety and thank you for validating that he's not in recovery. Oh, this is a follow-up. Um, how long on average does it take for an addict to not be emotionally abusive after they actually get into recovery? And are there any groups for men besides the one-on-one -on -one group that he already attended that are during the day that you would recommend? And yes, the link would be great, please. Um, Tammy, I'll let you answer while I dig up the doghouse link. Well, I, I just put the drop-in group and webinar link in the chat because I pre-read the question. So oh, okay. those are, are on there and, and there are 12 steps. But here's the deal. If he's still acting out, he can take the sex addiction 101 again. Like we've had guys that have done that because they didn't, you know, like they'll hear, it. do you know how many hundreds, if not thousands of first step meetings I've been to in my recovery? And if I go with an open mind, I can get something out of it every single time. So, so this is not one and done, you know, so I like, to me, 
he is still at the very beginning of this process. He may not have been paying attention the first time he took sex addiction 101 part one. And there's three parts. So if he didn't take all three parts, I would invite him to consider that too. As far as being emotionally abusive, like if he's actually in recovery, you know, like that, that would change. He would start to grow up. Now that person shared a bit earlier that it's been two years and there's still some, you know, whatever to me, that's like somebody that is probably still straddling the fence a bit, not really leaning into the work. I asked somebody earlier today, what are you doing on a daily basis? That is connection, not just reading a book, you know, or do I love my meditation? Don't get me wrong. But if all I could do is my meditation, that wouldn't be enough. I need to connect with other people who are in recovery, who can call me on my stuff if I need it, you know, but can support me if I'm really struggling with something, they're there to support me too. So, you, you know, to be accountable, I mentioned Debbie McRae's webinar, um, uh, she did on accountability. That's what we need in recovery is accountability. And that's what you would want to see. As far as the emotional abuse, I really encourage you for your emotional safety. Remember, that was one of the boundaries. What do you need? If he's acting emotionally abusive, you know, say next time you are emotionally abusive, I am walking away. You know, we will come back and have a conversation about whatever. But what do you need for your safety? Him doing it is that's on him. You taking care of you. What do you need to do to make yourself safe? even if he's not being so. Yeah. And as for, you know, how long on average does it take? I really don't like to answer those questions because, you know, how long on average does it take? I don't know. You know, it may never happen. It might happen 10 minutes from now. It might happen when he works step four. It might happen when he works step six or, you know, um, I'm big on the 12 steps. I, I think they really help with this um, as much as therapy. I think the 12 steps really is good for this. Um, you know, I, I would recommend that he take the out of the doghouse work group uh, and I pop the link in there. Um, that's a work group for men who've cheated, who want to repair their relationships. And it walks them through this stuff that they're still doing usually to their partner uh, beyond just getting sober. There's more to it. You have to understand what your partner's going through. You have to develop some empathy. You have to like actually feel your partner's pain. If an addict was empathetic toward his or her partner, they wouldn't behave the way they're behaving. I mean, I don't want to hurt somebody I love. Um, so I turn that part of my brain off and addicts get very, very disconnected from empathy, um, which allows them to be emotionally abusive, to blame you as a way of protecting their addiction, protecting their coping mechanism. Um, it's, it's really, you know, I, I really feel for betrayed partners who, whose addicts are still doing this kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, and, it, you know, it doesn't usually go away overnight, but, you know, some addicts get it really quickly and some addicts never get it at all. Um, and, I, you know, so I, I don't want to give you an average because you'll be hoping that's it. And then you'll be judging him against the average. And, you know, that's that's not going to help anybody. Um, it takes as long as it takes. And I also want to be really clear. Nothing you do or don't do will speed up the process. Period. This is totally on him. He has to choose to do the work of recovery. He has to choose to work the steps, to work his therapy, to do his assignments, to get a sponsor. And if he chooses that, there's a very good chance that his non-addictive but addiction-related behaviors, like you know, being a jerk, will change. And if he doesn't do that, there's a very good chance they won't change or they'll surface change. Um, you know, I'll check the boxes, I'll pretend and I'll, I'll, I'll do enough to make you think that I'm really changing and then wham, you get hit with it again. And that's the most horrible thing for a betrayed partner is when you think he's finally doing it, blam, there he is again. Um, and doesn't he understand how much he's hurting me? And, you know, the answer is no, he really doesn't. Um, because if he did, he wouldn't do it. 
um, unless he's a psychopath or a sociopath, then most addicts do not qualify on that, even if they sometimes look like they do. Um, I don't know anything you want to add to that. Tim? Well, I was thinking, you know, uh, here's a time frame, 90 meetings and 90 days. And I'm not yeah. saying he's going to be magically fixed, but, you know, this, again, sounds like a person who is not really doing any work. And, you know, I, like I, I was talking to somebody, I talked to lots of people. So, so any, this is no one person. This is a combination of lots of different people. So don't think I'm telling about you because yeah. I'm not. Um, but it, 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 like somebody was like, well, I'm, I'm seeing my therapist once a week and I'm going big deal. You know, that's, you know, 50 minutes a week for a, a problem that's 24 seven and decades old, you know, that is not enough, you know, particularly if you're just going and talking about what happened this week, you know, so you know, and you don't get a gold star for going to see your therapist. That is the very minimal thing. 90 meetings in 90 days, get a sponsor, work the steps and not just one, two and three and get stuck. You know, uh, our residential treatment program, but for you, and thank you for saying that you have boundaries for your safety. I, that is awesome. And then what do you need to do? And if he's going to act like that, you know, it is absolutely, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to step away. You step away. If he tries to follow you, nope. Um, you know, separate bedrooms, whatever you need to do for your safety. That's, you know, that's how this changes. You have no control over him. You can only control your actions and reactions. So, oh, one quick question. And then we, then, then we have to go. So, okay. <laughs> um, I am separated for three months now after 25 years and there is no going back. Um, his acting out was dangerous and shocking. He is not in recovery, but thinks he is. Lost his family, living in a bus, going to yoga every single day to make big changes in, in his life. I'm a yoga teacher. I know this is good and a part of healing, but I also know it is not enough. Um, he thinks the 12 step program is too depressing. Tried it five years ago <laughs> uh, and, it, and it seemed to be great for him. Um, I absolutely know that I cannot and will not control his recovery, but I have deep concerns for his future acting out and the possible effect on other people. But there is nothing I can do. I find this so hard to let go of and make peace with in my mind and soul. Whenever I see him, he seems to be on a high and doing great. And that is heartbreaking. Yeah, to me, that is I'm in denial and I'm pretending and compartmentalized. And so, but I love and and I hear the struggle and and I hear the compassion in, in you with it. There's nothing I can do. I find it so hard to let go and make peace with, in my mind and soul. And, and that will be the process. So uh, one more recommendation. Uh, Debbie McRae did a two-parter on grief. And this is called grief that you are going through that, you know, but, but here's the deal. You know that it's just a delusion. And yes, it will have a negative effect on him and other people. And everybody, like, that is outside your control. You, you get to take care of you um, really in a big way, you know, after 25 years. And, you know, he's on his own path. We have guys that come to our treatment program that go, I didn't have to lose my first marriage. They're on number three and they've got wreckage throughout all of that. There's nothing, the nothing the first wife, you know, could have done. It's, you know, that's, that's on them. So I, I honor your, you know, your compassion, but I, um, I encourage you to do the grief work. I think you'll find that most useful. Yeah. And loving people grieve, um, loving people are hurt when other people are not doing well um so that's that says lovely things about you that, that yeah. you're feeling pain about his but yeah it is heartbreaking so yeah um thank you everybody here's one more oh, thing that yeah. like uh -huh. i i had to learn not my circus not my monkeys i yeah. literally say that somebody shared that with me a number of years ago and like because I get so caught up in things and I, I honestly use that a lot. It's not my circus. I get people calling and I hear they're not going to do anything. And I go, not my circus, not my monkeys. You know, if people want help, I, I'm, I'm here. Scott's here. We're here. But for the people that don't, you know, we, we can't do anything about that. So thank yeah. you, Scott. Yeah. Appreciate thank you everybody it. for being here. Thank you for your great questions, Tammy. Thank you for letting me blindside you with all these <laughs> questions about betrayal trauma, but it was about time we did one of these. So, um, you know, David and I rarely address betrayal trauma so directly. And since you were here, I thought, what a good opportunity. I, I appreciate it and, and happy well, to help out. So thanks everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone.